Chapter Eight of Seventeen. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jonathan Burchard, May two thousand nine. Seventeen by Booth Tarkington. Chapter Eight. Jane. William's period of peculiar sensitiveness dated from that evening, and Jane, in particular, caused him a great deal of anxiety. In fact, he began to feel that Jane was a mortification which his parents might have spared him, with no loss to themselves or to the world. Not having shown that consideration for anybody, they might have at least been less spinelessly indulgent of her. William's bitter conviction was that he had never seen a child so starved of discipline or so lost to etiquette as Jane. For one thing, her passion for bread and butter covered with applesauce and powdered sugar was getting to be a serious matter. Secretly, William was not yet so changed by love as to be wholly indifferent to this refection himself, but his consumption of it was private, whereas Jane had formed the habit of eating it in exposed places, such as the front yard or the sidewalk. At no hour of the day was it advisable for a relative to approach the neighborhood in fastidious company, unless prepared to acknowledge kinship with a spindly young person either eating bread and butter and applesauce and powdered sugar, or all too visibly just having eaten bread and butter and applesauce and powdered sugar. Moreover, there were times when Jane had worse things than applesauce to answer for, as William made clear to his mother in an oration as hot as the July noon sun which looked down upon it. Mrs. Baxter was pleasantly engaged with the sprinkling can and some small flower beds in the shady backyard, and Jane, having returned from various sidewalk excursions, stood close by as a spectator, her hands replenished with the favorite food and her chin rising and falling in gentle motions, little prophecies of the slight distensions which passed down her slender throat with slow rhythmic regularity. Upon this calm scene came William, plunging round a corner of the house, furious yet plaintive. "'You've got to do something about that child,' he began. "'I cannot stand it!' Jane looked at him dumbly, not ceasing, however, to eat, while Mrs. Baxter thoughtfully continued her sprinkling. "'You've been gone all morning, Willie,' she said. "'I thought your father mentioned at breakfast that he expected you to put in at least four hours a day on your mathematics, and—' "'That's neither here nor there,' William returned vehemently. "'I just want to say this. If you don't do something about Jane, I will. Just look at her. Just look at her. I ask you, that's just the way she looked half an hour ago, out on the public sidewalk in front of the house, when I came by here with Miss Pratt.' That was pleasant, wasn't it, to be walking with a lady on the public street and meet a member of my family looking like that. Oh, lovely! In the anguish of this recollection his voice cracked, and though his eyes were dry his gestures wept for him. Plainly, he was about to reach the most lamentable portion of his narrative. And then she hollered at me! She hollered, Oh, Willie! Here he gave an imitation of Jane's voice, so damnatory that Jane ceased to eat for several moments and drew herself up with a kind of dignity. She hollered, Oh, Willie! at me, he stormed. Anybody would think I was about six years old. She hollered, Oh, Willie! and she rubbed her stomach and slushed applesauce all over her face, and she kept hollering, Willie! with her mouth full. Willie, look! Good! Bread and butter and applesauce and sugar! I bet you wish you had some, Willie! You did eat some! The other day! said Jane. You ate a whole lot! You eat it every chance you get! You hush up, he shouted, and returned to his description of the outrage. She kept following us. She followed us, hollering, Willie! till it's a wonder we don't go deaf. And just look at her. I don't see how you can stand it to have her going around like that and people knowing it's your child. Why, she hasn't got enough on. Mrs. Baxter laughed. Oh, for this very hot weather, I really don't think people notice or care much of... Notice, he wailed. I bet Miss Pratt noticed. Hot weather's no excuse for... for outright obesity. As Jane was thin, it is probable that William had mistaken the meaning of this word. Why, half of what she has got on has come unfastened, especially that frightful thing hanging around her leg. And look at her back! I just beg you, I ask you to look at her back. You can see her spinal cord. Column, Mrs. Baxter corrected. Spinal column, Willie. What do I care which it is, he fumed. People aren't supposed to go around with it exposed, whichever it is, and with applesauce on their ears. There is, there is not! Jane protested, and at the moment when she spoke, she was right. 
Naturally, however, she lifted her hands to the accused ears, and the unfortunate result was to justify William's statement. Look, he cried, I just ask you to look. Think of it. That's the sight I have to meet when I'm out walking with Miss Pratt. She asked me who it was, and I wish you'd seen her face. She wanted to know who that curious child was, and I'm glad you didn't hear the way she said it. Who is that curious child, she said, and I had to tell her it was my sister. I had to tell Miss Pratt it was my only sister. Willie, who is Miss Pratt? asked Mrs. Baxter mildly. I don't think I've ever heard of... Jane had returned to an admirable imperturbability, but she chose this moment to interrupt her mother and her own eating with remarks delivered in a tone void of emphasis or expression. Willie's mashed on her, she said casually, and she wears false side curls. One almost came off. At this unspeakable desecration, William's face was that of a high priest stricken at the altar. She's visiting Miss May Parcher, added the deadly Jane. But the Parchers are awful tired of her. They wish she'd go home, but they don't like to tell her so. One after another, these insults from the canale fell upon the ears of William. That slander so atrocious could soil the universal air seemed unthinkable. He became icily calm. Now, if you don't punish her, he said deliberately, it's because you have lost your sense of duty. Having uttered these terrible words, he turned upon his heel and marched toward the house. His mother called after him. Wait, Willie, Jane doesn't mean to hurt your feelings. My feelings, he cried, the iciness of his demeanor giving way under the strain of emotion. You stand there and allow her to speak as she did of one of the... one of the... For a moment, William appeared to be at a loss. And the fact is that it always had been a difficult manner to describe the bright, ineffable divinity of the world to one's mother, especially in the presence of an inimical third party of tender years. One of the he said, one of the, the noblest, one of the noblest. Again, he paused. Oh, Jane didn't mean anything, said Mrs. Baxter. And if you think Miss Pratt is so nice, I'll ask May Parcher to bring her to tea with us some day. If it's too hot, we'll have iced tea, and you can ask Johnny Watson if you like. Don't get so upset about things, Willie. Upset, he echoed, appealing to heaven against this word. Upset, and he entered the house in a manner most dramatic. "'What made you say that?' Mrs. Baxter asked, turning curiously to Jane when William had disappeared. "'Where did you hear any such things?' "'I was there,' Jane replied, gently eating on and on. William could come, and William could go, but Jane's elementary canal went on forever. "'Where were you, Jane?' "'At the Parchers.' "'Oh, I see.' "'Yesterday afternoon,' said Jane, "'when Miss Parcher had the Sunday school class for lemonade and cookies.' "'Did you hear Miss Parcher say, "'No,' said Jane. "'I ate too many cookies, I guess, maybe. "'Anyways, Miss Parcher said I better lay down. "'Lie down, Jane. "'Yes, I'm on the sofa in the library, "'and Mrs. Parcher and Mr. Parcher came in there "'and sat down after a while, and it was kind of dark, "'and they didn't hardly notice me, "'or I guess they thought I was asleep, maybe. "'Anyways, they didn't talk loud, "'but Mr. Parcher would sort of grunt and act cross. "'He said he just wished he knew "'when he was going to have a home again.' Then Mrs. Parcher said May had to ask her Sunday school class, but he said he never meant the Sunday school class. He said since Miss Pratt came to visit, there wasn't anywhere he could go, because Willie Baxter and Johnny Watson and Joe Bullitt and all the other ones like that were there all the time, and it made him just sick at the stomach. And he did wish there was some way to find out when she was going home, because he couldn't stand much more talk about love. He said Willie and Johnny Watson and Joe Bullitt and Miss Pratt were always arguing something about love, and he said Willie was the worst. Mama, he said he didn't like the rest of it, but he said he guessed he could stand it if it wasn't for Willie, and he said the reason they were also in love of Miss Pratt was because she talks baby talk, and he said he couldn't stand much more baby talk, Mama. She has the loveliest little white dog, and Mr. Parcher doesn't like it. He said he couldn't go anywhere around his place without stepping on the dog or Willie Baxter, and he said he couldn't sit on his porch any more. He said he couldn't sit even in the library, but he had to hear baby talk going on somewheres, and then either Willie Baxter or Joe Bullitt or somebody or another arguing about love. Mama, he said, Jane became impressive. He said, Mama, he said he didn't mind the Sunday school class, but he couldn't stand those damn boys. Jane, Mrs. Baxter cried, you mustn't say such things. I didn't, Mama. Mr. Parcher said it. He said he couldn't stand those damn... Jane, no matter what he said, you mustn't repeat. 
I'm, but I'm not. I only said Mr. Parcher said he couldn't stand those de Mrs. Baxter cut the argument short by imprisoning Jane's mouth with a firm hand. Jane continued to swallow quietly until released. Then she said, But, Mama, how can I tell you what he said unless I say, Hush! Mrs. Baxter commanded. You must never, never again use such a terrible and wicked word. I won't, Mama, Jane said meekly. Then she brightened. Oh, I know. I'll say word instead. Won't that be all right? I, I suppose so. Well, Mr. Parcher said he couldn't stand those word boys. That sounds all right, doesn't it, Mama? Mrs. Baxter hesitated, but she was inclined to hear as complete as possible a report of Mr. and Mrs. Parcher's conversation, since it seemed to concern William so nearly, and she well knew that Jane had her own way of telling things, or else they remained untold. I, I suppose so, Mrs. Baxter said again. Well, they kind of talked along, Jane continued, much pleased, and Mr. Parcher said when he was young he wasn't such a such a word fool as those young word fools were. He said in all his born days Willie Baxter was the wordest fool he ever saw. Willie Baxter's mother flushed a little. That was very unjust and very wrong of Mr. Parcher, she said primly. Oh, no, Mama, Jane protested. Mrs. Parcher thought so, too. Did she indeed? Only she didn't say word or wordist or anything like that, Jane explained. She said it was because Miss Pratt had coaxed him to be so in love of her, and Mr. Parcher said he didn't care whose fault it was. Willie was a, a, a word calf, and so were all the rest of them, Mr. Parcher said, and he said he couldn't stand it any more. Mr. Parcher said that a whole lot of times, Mama. He said he guessed pretty soon he'd have to be in the lunatic asylum if Miss Pratt stayed a few more days with her word little dog and her word Willie Baxter and all the other word calves. Mrs. Parcher said he oughtn't say word, Mama. She said, hush, hush to him, Mama. He talked like this, Mama, and he said, I'll be word if I stand it. And he kept getting crosser, and he said, word, 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 there. Mrs. Baxter interrupted sharply. That will do, Jane. We'll talk about something else now, I think. Jane looked hurt. She was taking great pleasure in this confidential interview, and gladly she would have continued to quote the harried Mr. Parcher at great length. Still, she was not entirely uncontent. She must have had some perception that her performance, merely as a notable bit of repertorial art, did not wholly lack style, even if her attire did. Yet, brilliant as Jane's work was, Mrs. Baxter felt no astonishment. Several times ere this, Jane had demonstrated a remarkable faculty for the retention of details concerning William, and running hand in hand with a really superb curiosity, this powerful memory was making Jane an even greater factor in William's life than he suspected. During the glamours of early love, if there be a creature more deadly than the little brother of a budding woman, that creature is the little sister of a budding man. The little brother at least tells in the open all he knows, often at full power of his lungs, and even that may be avoided, since he is wax in the hands of bribery. But the little sister is more apt to save her knowledge for use upon a terrible occasion, and no matter what bribe she may accept, she is certain to tell her mother everything. All in all, a young lover should arrange, if possible, to be the only child of elderly parents. Otherwise, his mother and sister are sure to know a great deal more about him than he knows that they know. This was what made Jane's eyes so disturbing to William during lunch that day. She ate quietly and competently, but all the while he was conscious of her solemn and inscrutable gaze fixed upon him, and she spoke not once. She could not have rendered herself more annoying, especially as William was trying to treat her with silent scorn, for nothing is more irksome to the muscles of the face than silent scorn, when there is no means of showing it except by the expression. On the other hand, Jane's inscrutability gave her no discomfort whatever. In fact, inscrutability is about the most comfortable expression that a person can wear, though the truth is that just now Jane was not really inscrutable at all. She was merely looking at William and thinking of Mr. Parcher. End of chapter 8